Chapters twenty three and twenty four of I Will Repay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Annie Kirkpatrick. I Will Repay by Baroness Orsi. Chapter twenty three. Justice. The day had been an unusually busy one. Five and thirty prisoners, arraigned before the bar of the Committee of Public Safety, had been tried in the last eight hours, an average of rather more than four to the hour, twelve minutes and a half in which to send a human creature, full of life and health, to solve the great enigma which lies hidden beyond the waters of the Styx. And Citizen Deputy Foucault Tinville, the public prosecutor, had surpassed himself. He seemed indefatigable. Each of these five-and-thirty prisoners had been arraigned for treason against the Republic, for conspiracy with her enemies, and all had to have irrefutable proofs of their guilt brought before the Committee of Public Safety. Sometimes a few letters, written to friends abroad, and seized at the frontier. A word of condemnation of the measures of the extremists, an expression of horror at the massacres on the Place de la Révolution, where the guillotine creaked incessantly, these were irrefutable proofs, or else perhaps a couple of pistols, or an old family sword seized in the house of a peaceful citizen, would be brought against a prisoner, is an irrefutable proof of his warlike dispositions against the Republic. Oh, it was not difficult. Out of five and thirty indictments, Foucault Tinville had obtained thirty convictions. No wonder his friends declared that he had surpassed himself. It had indeed been a glorious day, and the glow of satisfaction as much as the heat caused the public prosecutor to mop his high, bony cranium before he had adjourned for the much-needed respite for refreshment. The day's work was not yet done. The politicals had been disposed of, and there had been such an accumulation of them recently that it was difficult to keep pace with the arrests. And in the meanwhile the criminal record of the great city had not diminished. Because men butchered one another in the name of equality, there were none the fewer among the fraternity of thieves and petty pilferers, of ordinary cutthroats and public wantons. And these two had to be dealt with by law. The guillotine was impartial, and fell with equal velocity on the neck of the proud duke and the gutter-born fille de joie, on a descendant of the Bourbons and the wastrel born in a brothel. The ministerial decrees favored the proletariat. A crime against the republic was indefensible, but one against the individual was dealt with, with all the paraphernalia of an elaborate administration of justice. There were citizen judges and citizen advocates, and the rabble, who crowded in to listen to the trials, acted as honorary jury. It was all thoroughly well done. The citizen criminals were given every chance. The afternoon of this hot August day, one of the last of glorious Fructidor, had begun to wane, and the shades of evening to slowly creep into the long, bare room where this travesty of justice was being administered. The citizen president sat at the extreme end of the room, on a rough wooden bench, with a desk in front of him littered with papers. Just above him, on the bare, whitewashed wall, the words, la république une et indivisible and below them the device liberté égalité fraternité to the right and left of the citizen president four clerks were busy making entries in that ponderous ledger that amazing record of the foulest crimes the world has ever known the bulletin de tribunal revolutionnaire at present no one is speaking and the grating of the clerks quill pens against the paper is the only sound which disturbs the silence of the hall in front of the president, on a bench lower than his, sits citizen Foucault Tinville, rested and refreshed, ready to take up his occupation, for as many hours as his country demands it of him. On every desk a tallow candle, smoking and spluttering, throws a weird light and more weird shadows on the faces of clerks and president, on blank walls and ominous devices. In the center of the room a platform surrounded by an iron railing is ready for the accused. Just in front of it, from the tall, raftered ceiling above, there hangs a small brass lamp with a green abajou. On each side of the long, whitewashed walls there are three rows of benches, beautiful old carved oak pews, snatched from Notre Dame and the churches of St. Eustache and St. Germain Lucerois. Instead of the pious worshippers of medieval times, they now accommodate the lookers-on of the grim spectacle of unfortunates in their brief halt before the scaffold. The front row of these benches is reserved for those citizen deputies who desire to be present at the debates of the Tribunal Revolutionnaire. It is their privilege, almost their duty, as representatives of the people, to see that the sittings are properly conducted. These benches are already well filled. At one end, on the left, Citizen Merlin, Minister of Justice, sits. Next to him, Citizen Minister Lebrun, also Citizen Robespierre, still in the height of his ascendancy, and watching the proceedings with those pale, watery eyes of his and that curious, disdainful smile, which have earned for him the nickname of the sea-green incorruptible. Other well-known faces are there also, dimly outlined in the fast-gathering gloom. 
but every one notes Citizen Deputy Deroulet, the idol of the people, as he sits on the extreme end of a bench on the right, with arms tightly folded across his chest, the light from the hanging lamp falling straight on his dark head and proud, straight brows, with the large, restless, eager eyes. Anon the Citizen President rings a handbell, and there is a discordant noise of hoarse laughter and loud curses, some pushing, jolting, and swearing, as the general public is admitted into the hall. Heaven save us! What a rabble! Has humanity really such a scum? Women with a single ragged kirtle and shift, through the interstices of which the naked, grime-covered flesh shows shamelessly, with bare legs and feet thrust into heavy sabots, hair dishevelled, and evil spirit-sodden faces, women without a semblance of womanhood, with shriveled, barren breasts and dry, parched lips that have never known how to kiss women without emotion save that of hate, without desire save for the satisfaction of hunger and thirst, and lust for revenge against their sisters less wretched, less unsexed than themselves. They crowd in, jostling one another, swarming into the front rows of the benches, where they can get a better view of the miserable victims about to be pilloried before them. And the men without a semblance of manhood, bent under the heavy care of their own degradation, dead to pity, to love, to chivalry, dead to all save an inordinate longing for the sight of blood and god help them all for there were children too children save the mark with pallid precocious little faces pinched with the ravages of starvation gazing with dim filmy eyes on this world of rapacity and hideousness children who have seen death oh the horror of it not beautiful peaceful death a slumber or a dream a loved parent or fond sister or brother lying all in white amidst a wealth of flowers but death in its most awesome aspect violent lurid horrible and now they stare around them with eager greedy eyes awaiting the amusement of the spectacle gazing at the president with his tall phrygian cap at the clerks wielding their indefatigable quill pens writing 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 at the flickering lights throwing clouds of sooty smoke up to the dark ceiling above then suddenly the eyes of one little mite a poor tiny midget not yet in her teens a light on paul deroulet's face on the opposite side of the room cha papa deroulet she says pointing an attenuated little finger across at him and turning eagerly to those around her her eyes dilating in wishful recollection of a happy afternoon spent in papa deroulet's house with fine white bread to eat in plenty and great jars of foaming milk he rouses himself from his apathy and his great earnest eyes lose the look of agonized misery as he responds to the greeting of the little one. For one moment, oh, a mere fraction of a second, the squalid faces, the miserable, starved expressions of the crowd, soften at sight of him. There is a faint murmur amongst the women, which perhaps God's recording angel registered as a blessing. Who knows? Foucault Tenville suppresses a sneer, and the citizen president impatiently rings his handbell again. Bring forth the accused, he commands in stentorian tones. There is a movement of satisfaction among the crowd, and the angel of God is forced to hide his face again. Chapter 24 The Trial of Juliette It is all indelibly placed on record in the Bulletin du Tribunal Révolutionnaire, under date 25th of Fructidor, year 1 of the Revolution. Anyone who cares may read, for the bulletin is in the archives of the Bibliothèque Nationale of Paris. One by one the accused have been brought forth, escorted by two men of the National Guard in ragged, stained uniforms of red, white, and blue, they were then conducted to the small raised platform in the centre of the hall, and made to listen to the charge brought against them by Citizen Foucault Tanville, the public prosecutor. These were petty charges mostly, pilfering, fraud, theft, occasionally arson or manslaughter. One man, however, was arraigned for murder with highway robbery, and a woman for the most ennoble traffic, which evil feminine ingenuity could invent. These two were condemned to the guillotine, the other sent to the galleys at Brest or Toulon, the forger along with the petty thief, the housebreaker with the absconding clerk. There was no room in the prison for ordinary offences against the criminal code. They were overfilled already with so-called traitors against the Republic. Three women were sent to the penitentiary at the Salpetriere, and were dragged out of the court shrilly protesting their innocence, and followed by obscene jeers from the spectators on the benches. Then there was a momentary hush. Juliette Marny had been brought in. She was quite calm and exquisitely beautiful, dressed in a plain grey bodice and kirtle, with a black band round her slim waist and a soft white kerchief folded across her bosom. Beneath the tiny white cap, her golden hair appeared in dainty, curly profusion. Her childlike oval face was very white, but otherwise quite serene. She seemed absolutely unconscious of her surroundings, and walked with a firm step up to the platform, looking neither to the right nor to the left of her. Therefore she did not see Deroulet. 
A great, a wonderful radiance seemed to shine in her large eyes, the radiance of self-sacrifice. She was offering not only her life, but everything a woman of refinement holds most dear, for the safety of the man she loved. A feeling that was almost physical pain, so intense was it, overcame Deroulade, when at last he heard her name loudly called by the public prosecutor. All day he had waited for this awful moment, forgetting his own misery, his own agonized feeling of an irretrievable loss, in the horrible thought of what she would endure, what she would think, when first she realized the terrible indignity which was to be put upon her. Yet for the sake of her, of her chances of safety and of ultimate freedom, it was undoubtedly that it should be so. Arraigned for conspiracy against the Republic, she was liable to secret trial, to be brought up, condemned, and executed before he could even hear of her whereabouts, before he could throw himself before her judges and take all guilt upon himself. Those suspected of treason against the Republic forfeited, according to Merlin's most iniquitous law, their rights of citizenship, in publicity of trial and in defense. It all might have been finished before Deroulade knew anything of it. The other way was, of course, more terrible. Brought forth amongst the scum of criminal Paris, on a charge, the horror of which, he could but dimly hope that she was too innocent to fully understand, he dared not even think of what she would suffer. But undoubtedly it was better so. The mud thrown at her robes of purity could never cling to her, and at least her trial would be public. He would be there to take all infamy, all disgrace, all opprobrium on himself. The strength of his appeal would turn her judge's wrath from her to him, and after these few moments of misery she would be free to leave Paris, France, to be happy and to forget him and the memory of him. An overwhelming, all-compelling love filled his entire soul for the beautiful girl, who had so wronged yet so nobly tried to save him. A longing for her made his very sinews ache. She was no longer Madonna, and her beauty thrilled him with the passionate, almost sensuous desire to give his life for her. The indictment against Juliet Marnie has become history now. On that day, the 25th of Fructidor, at seven o'clock in the evening, it was read out by the public prosecutor and listened to by the accused, so the bulletin tells us, with complete calm and apparent indifference. She stood up in that same pillory where once stood poor, guilty Charlotte Corday, where presently would stand proud, guiltless Marie Antoinette, and Desrolais listened to the scurrilous document, with all the outward calm his strength of will could command. He would have liked to rise from his seat then and there, at once, and in mad, purely animal fury have, with a blow of his fist, quashed the words in Fouquois Tinville's lying throat. But for her sake he was bound to listen, and above all, to act quietly, deliberately, according to form and procedure, so as in no way to imperil her cause. Therefore he listened whilst the public prosecutor spoke. Juliet Marney, you are hereby accused of having, by a false and malicious denunciation, slandered the person of a representative of the people. You cause the Revolutionary Tribunal, through this same mischievous act, to bring a charge against this representative of the people, to institute a domiciliary search in his house, and to waste valuable time which otherwise belonged to the service of the Republic. And this you did, not from a misguided sense of duty towards your country, but in wanton and impure spirit, to be rid of the surveillance of one who had your welfare at heart, and who tried to prevent your leading the immoral life which had become a public scandal, and which has now brought you before this court of justice, to answer to a charge of wantonness, impurity, defamation of character, and corruption of public morals. In proof of which I now place before the court your own admission, that more than one citizen of the Republic has been led by you into immoral relationship with yourself, and further, your own admission that your accusation against Citizen Deputy Desrolades was false and mischievous, and further and finally, your immoral and obscene correspondence with some persons unknown, which you vainly tried to destroy. In consideration of which, and in the name of the people of France, whose spokesman I am, I demand that you be taken hence from this hall of justice to the Place de la Révolution, in full view of the citizens of Paris and its environs, and clad in a soiled white garment, emblem of the smirch upon your soul, that there you be publicly whipped by the hands of Citizen Sampson, the public executioner, after which that you be taken to the prison of the Salpetriere, there to be further detained at the discretion of the Committee of Public Safety. And now, Juliette Marny, you have heard the indictment preferred against you. Have you anything to say why the sentence which I have demanded shall not be passed upon you? Jeers, shouts, laughter, and curses greeted this speech of the public prosecutor. All that was most vile and most bestial in this miserable, misguided people struggling for utopia and liberty seemed to come to the surface, while listening to the reading of this most infamous document. The delight of seeing this beautiful, ethereal woman, almost unearthly in her proud aloofness, 
smirched with the vilest mud to which the vituperation of man can contrive to sink, was a veritable treat to the degraded wretches. The women yelled hoarse approval, the children not understanding, laughed in mirthless glee, the men, with loud curses, showed their appreciation of Foucault Tinville's speech. As for Deroulade, the mental agony he endured surpassed any torture which the devils, they say, reserved for the damned. His sinews cracked in his frantic efforts to control himself. He dug his fingernails into his flesh, trying by physical pain to drown the sufferings of his mind. He thought that his reason was tottering, that he would go mad if he heard another word of his infamy. The hooting and yelling of that filthy mob sounded like the cries of lost souls, shrieking from hell. All his pity for them was gone, his love for humanity, his devotion to the suffering poor. A great and immense hatred for this ghastly revolution, and the people it professed to free, filled his whole being, together with a mad, hideous desire to see them suffer, starve, die a miserable, loathsome death. The passion of hate, that now overwhelmed his soul, was at least as ugly as theirs. He was, for one brief moment, now at one with them in their inordinate lust for revenge. Only Juliet, throughout all this, remained calm, silent, and passive. She had heard the indictment, heard the loathsome sentence, for her white cheeks had gradually become ashy pale, but never for a moment did she depart from her attitude of proud aloofness. She never once turned her head towards the mob who insulted her. She waited in complete passiveness until the yelling and shouting had subsided, motionless save for her fingertips, which beat an impatient tattoo upon the railing in front of her. The bulletin says that she took out her handkerchief and wiped her face with it. le franc qui fut parli this year. The heat had become oppressive. The atmosphere was overcharged with the dank, penetrating odor of steaming, dirty clothes. The room, though vast, was close and suffocating. The tallow candles flickering in the humid, hot air threw the faces of the president and clerks into bold relief, with curious caricature effects of light and shade. The petrol lamp above the head of the accused had flared up and begun to smoke, causing the chimney to crack with a sharp report. This diversion effected a momentary silence among the crowd, and the public prosecutor was able to repeat his query. Juliet Marney, have you anything to say in reply to the charge brought against you, and why the sentence which I have demanded should not be passed against you? The sooty smoke from the lamp came down in small, black, greasy particles. Juliet, with her slender fingertips, flicked one of these quietly off her sleeve. Then she replied, No, I have nothing to say. Have you instructed an advocate to defend you, according to your rights of citizenship, which the law allows? added the public prosecutor solemnly. Juliet would have replied at once. Her mouth had already framed the no for which she meant to answer. But now at last had come Deroulade's hour. For this he had been silent, had suffered and had held his peace, whilst twice twenty-four hours had dragged their weary lengths along since the arrest of the woman he loved. In a moment he was on his feet before them all, accustomed to speak, to dominate, to command. Citizeness Juliet Marney has entrusted me with her defense, he said, even before the no had escaped Juliet's white lips and I am here to refute the charges brought against her, and to demand in the name of the people of France full acquittal and justice for her. In chapters 23 and 24